I'm uh, starting a new message this morning called Buying and Storing Oil. Our series is Midnight Oil, and we're going to take it really from the scripture that's found in Matthew 25, where Jesus spoke about a cry rang out at midnight, and people needed oil at that time. Jesus' return was one of the last kind of great themes just before Jesus went to the cross. He began to talk to his disciples about, I'm going to come back. Because, because that had been their focus. They'd begun to ask him, Lord, what's going to happen? What's coming up? And so Jesus had said, he'd explained, I need to suffer, I need to die, but I promise I will come back. And so this idea that the church, uh, certainly in the first century, was captivated by this idea that Jesus is coming back. Because when he ascended, and uh, the, he ascended slowly into a cloud, and the angels stood there and said, he's going to come back the same way, guys. So the church was this, you know, every now and again, everyone was looking at the clouds, maybe, maybe he's going to show up. There was this anticipation of Jesus' return. And that's not so much in the modern church. We've kind of lost that beauty uh, about the fact that Jesus may return. And, but there is this idea that, one, for example, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 8 says, therefore, encourage one another with these words. It says, the sky's going to roll back. Jesus is going to show up. He's going to destroy all evil. It's going to be glorious. So encourage one another with these things. It's not an encouragement that I hear a lot in the church nowadays. But Jesus has this basic expectation because he laid this out to his, his, his disciples. He said, listen, I'm going to come back. But this time, I'm not coming back beaten and whipped and crucified. I'm coming back crowned the king of glory. I'm coming back with glory. And the whole earth together will see it. I don't know how the Lord's going to do that, wrap the earth. I don't know what's going to happen. But everybody at the same time is going to see him coming. Now, here's the principle. James talks about the fact that Jesus' coming is Jesus not slow in keeping that promise of his coming. He's very quick. The reason Jesus hasn't come back is because he's God, the Bible says, is being patient with us. Because he doesn't want anyone to perish. Because the day Jesus comes back, he wraps up history, and then we, we're into judgment. Then we're going to talk books. We're opening books and things. So he, he, Jesus is, is, is hungry to come back for his bride, and he's about to come. And then the Father says, uh, we, there's, there's some there we're still dealing with. So James says, don't. Because people are, are mocking and they go, where is this coming? Where is this coming? Seriously. And, and James says, don't, don't misunderstand that. Don't misunderstand the delay. The delay is God's patience with you. That principle, by the way, carries through into a lot of different areas. That was for free. Right? God is not... In fact, when the time comes, the Bible says, as lightning flashes from the east to the west, so shall the, son, the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus is going to come back in an instant, the very instant the Father says, okay, we're done. It's going to be very quick. Right. So this idea that, that we, uh, at least uh, for those who, who love Jesus, there is a kind of a lovesick longing for his return. And so the end of Revelation says, the, the scripture says, the spirit and the bride say, come, Lord Jesus. Right? There's this, there's this symbiotic, there's this, this unity between the Holy Spirit and the bride of Christ, and we're all saying, come, Lord Jesus. Now, Jesus, therefore, has an expectation of those who love him that they will not have forgotten his promise. I promise you I'm coming back. And he's interested in who's going to be waiting for his return. Because I want you to imagine, imagine now you're the bridegroom, you're Jesus, and you've got engaged and you've had to be away from your fiance for about 18 months to two years because your culture has demanded that you have to make arrangements. You have to get a job and you have to get money in the bank and you have to build up business relationships and you have to build a house and uh, you have to get everything ready so that when it's time for you to collect your bride, she comes back into a prepared place. Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. If it wasn't so, I wouldn't have told you, but I'm going to my father's house. I'm making space for you, Right? Now, because imagine the bride's father is royalty, you can't just build a shack. You have to build a palace, right? So more than your culture's mandate, you have to make it fit for a queen. So you, you work hard. Jesus is currently working hard to blow your mind. Because that's what the Bible says. No eye has seen, no ear has you know, heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. This, Jesus is working on this, right? So he is knee deep in making it right for you. 
and he wants to come back. Now, his expectation is that when he comes back, that his bride is eagerly awaiting him. But imagine that it's taken so long that she gets bored and begins to date other men. You're like, but I'm building this palace for you. And you're flirting with other people. His expectation is that all of this preparation that he's been doing is mirrored by all the preparation she's been doing. Because any, any a, a prospective bride is getting herself ready for a wedding day, right? She's building a trousseau. She's, she's developing skills. She's also learning. This is why we're here. The attendants of the bride are supposed to equip the bride to be the eternal consort for the king of glory. This is our job. And so when Jesus comes back, he's coming back with great anticipation that you and I are eagerly awaiting his return, not busy, caught up with other stuff. See, Jesus said this. I don't know why this is taking so much time, but Jesus said this. He said, in the days of Noah, people were marrying, being given in marriage, they were doing business, and, and then the, 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 the waters began to flow. And, and people were so dull to the spiritual reality that when it hit, they were shocked. And he said, this is the way it's going to be. When, when God comes back, when Jesus comes back, those who are eagerly awaiting him will have seen the signs and are like, it's almost, he's here. Those who have lost themselves, they've forgotten, they've got bored, they're looking out, they've found other lovers, will, will be engaged in that sort of stuff so that his coming will be like a thief in the night. So we don't want to be those people. We want to be the bride anticipating, looking at the horizon. Is it today? Now, even, even though Jesus is out of sight, he shouldn't be out of mind. As his bride, we're learning and we're working as hard as we can to eagerly await the day of his return. We're gathering everything we need to be the future queen. She sends love letters with her fragrance on them. I had to do push-ups in the army because my letters used to come from Michelle with perfume smelling. I had to pay for that letter with effort. <laughs> she sends him letters, love letters. We call them prayers. She sends words of poetry and romance and declarations of her love. We call that worship. Reports of her progress and how much she's learned get sent to him. We call that spending time in the word. His expectation is that he's coming back for a longing bride, faithfully getting ready, eager for his return. And so the scriptures just very briefly talk about three aspects to his return. Number one, he's, he's waiting for those who eagerly will wait him. So Christ also having been offered, according to Hebrews 9, uh, once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly wait for him. There's an expectation that we should be eager for his return. Do you understand from heaven's perspective, there's a difference between those who are eager and those who are not eager. Those who are longing and those who are indifferent. It's pretty easy to see, almost instant. Secondly, He's waiting for those who long. It's very similar. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day and not only to me but also to those who have longed and whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Now, in his last discussion with his disciples, or one of the last discussions, Jesus talks about the end times but specifically his coming. And he gives insight into what is going to happen in the culmination of this statement. Therefore, keep watch because you don't know the day or the hour. Full repentance, if you know what I mean. But that's not the way he set it up. He said, no, no, you don't know when I'm coming back. So I want you to be willing. I want you to be eager. And I want you to be doing faithfully what you know I've called you to do. Because you don't know the day or the hour. 
So Jesus framed the way the last days are going to work in a way that suggests it's going to be a little chaotic, the best of times for the glory of God, the worst of times because of the evil of the day. And there are some things that we ought to be doing in that last time that are going to be wise habits. So I want to talk about that. So let me take you to Matthew 25, to the parable that just is the bedrock of most of what we're doing now. I felt, I was, uh, I've said this before, was with Michael Maiden, we were having a discussion about, just about the church, the global church, and where we're going, and what's happening. And we, we, we came across this, and, and it, something settled in my spirit. I felt like this is almost a guiding principle for us for the next few years. If you consider me a spiritual leader, then listen to me in this thing. This is the moment for the church to be searching for oil. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Let me just stop. Uh, in Jewish culture, 10 was the minimum number that you needed in order to execute a meeting or a, or, a, or a Jewish gathering. If there were 10 people, then it was valid. So you needed 10 witnesses to a wedding, so it became normal for there to be at least 10 bridesmaids who would hold lamps because the bridegroom, when he came back, would announce his return at the outskirts of the city with trumpet calls and the loud shout. Then they would come in and the, the, his attendants would run out holding lamps to light the way for the bridegroom to come into the bridal chamber, um, where they would then consummate their marriage and they would stay for a week of celebration and that would be the wedding uh, of, the, of the two. So Jesus is using this analogy, he's using this bridal context. And five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps and the bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come out and meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps and the foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. And the virgins who were ready went in with him to the banquet, to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came, Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch because you don't know the day or the hour. Both the foolish and the wise were waiting for the bridegroom. They both fell asleep waiting for him. They both woke up and trimmed their lamps and were hustling in the preparations. They were similar in almost every way, differentiated by only one. Their stores of oil. The folly of the foolish was that they did not make provision against the exhaustion of their oil. They stood there with their lamps burning and the, the wise were standing there with their lamps burning and another jar of oil in their hands and they're going, well, your lamp's not brighter than mine. I, what's wrong with mine? I got a bright lamp, you got a bright lamp. What's with all that oil? One of the things I believe we have to learn is to prepare for a long night. If the night is short, that's okay. You had more than you needed. If the night is long, your light can still burn. Prepare for a long night. The time of collection and the storing of oil is different from the time when the oil is needed. It's a work of preparation that's not attached to a current urgency. The moment arrives when the oil is needed is not the moment to try and go and get some more oil. Are you listening to me? There is no time for preparation when the oil is needed. Oil is needed and you dig into stores of oil that you have stored up. If oil is needed and there is no oil, your lamp goes out. So now is the opportunity not because we feel the urgency currently, but now is the opportunity. If you consider me a spiritual leader, listen to this, I'm telling you a truth. Now is our opportunity to go get oil for a long night. It's going to require faithful attention to his voice, despite the current circumstances. 
The question isn't, do you have enough for now? The question is, do you have enough for a long night? Do you have enough for other people? I would add to the story, if they were really wise, they would have brought some for the foolish. Yeah, you can, okay, you can have my other store of oil. Matthew 24, Jesus said, just the chapter just in front of us, Jesus said, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most is going to grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. The foolish looked and said, our lamps are fine, and that short-sighted view was a problem. I have enough religion in my calendar. Life is going quite well for me, actually. I am amply supplied. Money is doing well. Uh, I don't want to get fanatical about Jesus. I mean, I think I'm in a good place. I'm satisfied with this level of connection to God. There are some other things in my life that are equally important. The wise said he's first. And they kept placing themselves in an environment where oil was available. Not dry theology, but oil-filled environments. The wise were prioritizing the kingdom. They were quick-footed to respond to the Holy Spirit's voice. They lingered longer than friends do. But like lovesick lovers, they find it hard to move away from places where God is manifesting. That longing is satiated only by His presence and they feed their hopes and the dreams that, that the Holy Spirit has begun to whisper on the inside of them. Those flames will go out if they're not refueled with oil. They are wise, not because their current circumstances dictated their need, but they understood the wait may be longer than we think. The delay may be more than we want. So I'm going to gather more oil. I'm going to be dripping with oil. I'm going to fill every bucket I have with oil. I'm going to take as much with me as I can. Why? Because I want to be somebody who other people can get oil from as well. I want to be able to have light enough for the end of the night. I want to have enough oil. I want to minister to other people. But I can't, in the moment, I can't generate oil. Oil is bought and gathered outside of the moment of need. That's the whole sermon. We can go home now. So Greg, that's great. I'm in. Where can I buy oil? Right? Where can I buy oil? I, I want to go. I'm in. Matthew. This is not Matthew. This is Revelations. It says this. I advise you to buy from me gold. This is Jesus speaking in Revelation. Refined in the fire so that you can become rich. White garments so that you can clothe yourself. So that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I counsel you to buy from me I salve to anoint your eyes so that you can see. Just before that, he says to the people, you say, I'm rich, I'm healthy, I don't need a thing, but you don't realize that you're poor, pitiful, blind and naked, I counsel you. I counsel you. See, there's a place where you stop, where the oil stops flowing in your life, you get dry and brittle and your heart gets hardened and you go, yeah, I don't, God, I don't really need God, what do I need God for? I'm an American or whatever else you want to put in the place of God. I'm telling you, there's, there, is a, there is an opportunity for this nation, particularly in this world, to bring a revival. Honestly, I believe with all my heart, this is the, this is the greatest nation on the earth. But if all we did was export our culture, I think we felt short of the call of God. I think there is, a, there is an opportunity for us to bring God's revival to the world. I can live for that. I can die for that. The word masa in, in the Hebrew means to smear or to wipe or to spread a liquid. That's what it means. The anointing in the, in the Greek literally means to rub off. What rubs off on you from someone else. 
what's been smeared on you or wiped off or stuck to you, when you, when you, if somebody's been messy with the syrup and you, and you want to put some syrup in your pancake and you pick it up and there's syrup on the outside of the, what's left on your fingers is the anointing of the syrup bowl. It's what's come off on you. Now, now it's everywhere. Now you touch everywhere. Someone who fell into a vat of oil jumps out and gives you a big hug. What's left on your clothes is the anointing. Right? That's what it means. Now the Bible says the fullness of the Godhead lived bodily in Jesus and because you're in him, you have been brought to fullness. God gave his son, John 3 says, God gave Jesus the spirit without measure and so if you want to buy oil, the place you have to go is to the anointed one, which is what Messiah means. Christos the anointed one, Messiah, the anointed one. God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and anybody who wants oil has to go find it, rub shoulders with him and oil comes onto your life. Greg, how do I get oil? You go to the anointed one. Now this is all over scripture. Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me, Jesus said, right? He quotes from the Old Testament. Uh, who has conspired, Psalm 2 uh, Acts says, against the Lord and against his anointed one. Acts 10, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. Hebrews 1, God has anointed you above your companions with the oil of joy. There's plenty more scripture. The point I'm just trying to show you is that the scriptures teach that Jesus is the anointed one. He is the one that God has put his anointing, his spirit, his anointing, his flow on Jesus. And then the Bible turns around and says, now Jesus is the one that anoints the church. He anoints us. So let me show you some of those. We were all by one spirit baptized into one body. We were all sealed with the same Holy Spirit. And that same Holy Spirit has come to dwell in us. Baptized, sealed, and indwelt baptized, sealed, and indwelt by the Holy Spirit. That, those three are all put together in the one scripture, which is probably the best one, 2 Corinthians 1. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us. He set his seal of ownership on us. He put his spirit in our hearts. All right? So when you came to Christ and when you bowed the knee and you opened up your heart and you said, come, Lord, he would put his anointing on you. And because that anointing abides and doesn't go away, that anointing will stay with you. But there is this call in the church to be being filled with the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 5. It says, be constantly being filled. Be constantly receiving. Be constantly open to the flowing of the Holy Spirit. So people say, well, I, I, I received the Holy Spirit. Back, it was back in 60. And I, I, you know, bless God, that was enough for me. I'm going, well... It, that is enough because he never leave you. But the scripture says there needs to be an openness in our hearts to constantly be being filled. Yeah. While God only fills people once. Not, well, not really. Because Peter got uh, breathed on by Jesus and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. And then Peter was at Pentecost and then he got filled with the Holy Spirit. And then in Acts 4, Peter's praying with him and the, and the Holy Spirit shakes the building and they were all filled again with the, with the Holy Spirit and with power. And then there's at least Four times that Peter, he was filled with the Spirit. We have this openness and a longing for more. The constant flow of the Spirit of God through our lives. Now let me just tell you, because I think this is where we're going to get to the meat of what I think how it applies to you. There are five fundamental things that oil was a symbol of. Now, over 200 times in the scriptures, oil is mentioned in most part when, when it's not speaking about physical oil that you need to put into a recipe. When it's talking about oil and there's any sort of symbolism attached to it, it's always talking about the working of the Holy Spirit. It's usually connected to him. And so you'll find that the first thing that oil was a symbol of or used for was in the consecration of somebody to an office. So when, when you when they appointed a priest or a prophet or a king, they anointed them with oil. And there was a specific recipe and there, there was a way and there was anointing oil, but, but they would anoint somebody with oil. And that oil was a symbol, it was a demonstration, it was a physical manifestation on somebody of a spiritual reality. And so they would consecrate somebody to office. That means they would be set aside for a sacred work. 
all the implements that were used in the tabernacle, which, you know, the, the fork and the spoon and the snuffer to put out the candle, those were ordinary things that, that uh, Hebrews would use in their homes, but they would take those and they would anoint them with holy oil. And once they'd been anointed and dedicated, they were set aside and used only, allowed only to be used for sacred service. So when the Spirit of God puts, when, God, when Jesus puts the anointing of God on you, what he's saying to you is you are called to be set aside for sacred service. Not supposed to be used for mundane. Set aside for sacred. And so Paul, in Timothy, he, he agrees with this and he says, listen, in a large house there are articles, uh, some for noble purposes, some for ignoble. And he says, um, that's just the reality of everybody's life. And he says, if you cleanse yourself, if you agree with this anointing, if you cleanse yourself from the latter, you will be an instrument made holy, useful to the master and prepared for any good work that there is a participation, an agreement in my own life with the anointing of God that has been put on me that I'm set aside now to a sacred place. I'm set aside to a sacred purpose. And you go, but Greg, you don't understand. I'm a business person. Yes, you're a business person who has been set aside for a sacred purpose. No less holy. So when God puts the anointing of God on you, that anointing will always call you towards holiness, always draw you to upright, push you away from ungodliness. Number two. The second thing anointing oil was used for was for consecration but illumination in the temple. They would sprinkle the tabernacle and the furnishings to mark them as holy and set apart by the Lord, but that oil would also then be the thing that burned the lamps. And that's how the lamps were sustained in the building and, and from, from uh, dusk to dawn. That oil needed to flow. And so this idea of illumination, that the Holy Spirit will come and give us understanding in our own lives, is part of why the anointing of God comes on us. And 1 Corinthians 2 says that if the, the Spirit of God will teach you spiritual truth using spiritual words, and the people who don't have the Spirit of God, to them the things of the Spirit are foolishness, but to us who are being saved, they are the beautiful wisdom of God. So the Holy Spirit wants to bring illumination to us. He wants to explain things to us. The illumination of God is why God put his anointing in you. The Holy Spirit wants to give you understanding, not just about his word, not just about his nature, but about your life specifically. He wants you to understand. He wants you to know. He wants you to walk in wisdom. He wants you to understand what's coming and what to do and how to avoid things. He will tell you of things yet to come. Number three, anointing oil was a symbol of the filling and the empowering of the Holy Spirit. And you'll see a bunch of scriptures there, uh, for example. And when, when, the, when they would anoint somebody, the Spirit of God would come upon them. The outward sign was oil dripping down. The inward reality was the Spirit of God took up residence and would move them and empower them. So this idea that oil is an empowering of the Spirit of God. So when we say, Lord, give us your oil, we're saying, empower us, fill us afresh, give us strength. The fourth thing is that oil symbolized the healing work of the Holy Spirit. James 5, is any one of you sick, you should call for the elders to pray over them, to anoint them with oil, and the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. And if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another so you can be healed. There is this moment where you, where you anoint somebody with oil and you lay hands on them, and there's an expectation that the healing of God flows. This idea that oil always produced that in the lives of people. And number five, Oil was used to symbolize, anointing was used to symbolize the teaching work of the Holy Spirit, how he teaches. And 1 John 2 says, but as you have an anointing from the Holy One, and as that anointing is real, and as it abides in you, listen to what it says, that anointing is real and will not prove false, that anointing teaches you to remain in Christ. The anointing will teach you. You don't have need that anyone teach you, but the anointing will teach you. 
So there's something about the Spirit of God's work in our life that He'll explain spiritual things and He'll whisper things in our hearts and He'll teach you and instruct you in the way that you and I should go. Now I have um, not much else to say. I felt like there was going to be a few people here that... um, can I just have my phone? I, I felt like there were a couple of people the Lord spoke to me about, and I, I just, well, I wasn't going to bring it up, but I felt like I want to now. Uh, is there a lady here? I think your name is Maureen, and August 27th is, uh, I think, your birthday. Um, the Lord is here with a healing. Uh, is there anyone here like that? If you see, there's a, there's a lady called Maureen, and the Lord wants to heal, I think, through your ears. And then there's a, 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 a young man, I think, called Devin. And the Lord wants to heal. There's a healing thing for your foot and your toe. The Lord wants to do that. You can come see me afterwards. I'd love to pray with you. Uh, there's a few things that I'd like to pray as we finish this session. Um, I think there are some people here that, uh, that um, have felt the Lord's anointing come on them. And you've got lost in the busyness of the world and the... You know, the weeds have grown up and snares have entangled you and you feel like that call of God that he put on your life was no longer valid. That somehow you lost, you missed out on the call of God. That somehow your weakness or your failure has, has God has said, oh, that's enough, I'm, I'm done with you. Uh, I, just, I just felt like the Lord says, the giftings and the callings of God are irrevocable. He never takes them away. So there are some people here that I think the Lord wants to pour fresh oil onto your consecration. Because that's one of the reasons he does that. Number two, there's some people here, you, you just sit stuck and you go, Lord, I, I don't know. I, I, I need your help. I need you to talk to me, Lord. I really just need to understand which way to go. And, and I think the Lord wants to pour out some anointing oil to illuminate. You go, Lord, my, my, my little lamp is, this wick is almost bone dry. I've, I've you know, the last little drop of oil I have is on it and this little flame is flickering. And the Lord wants to just fill up the lamp with oil so the flame is steady. Some people here, the Lord wants to illuminate with oil. Some here, He wants to empower. Just pour power into you. Courage, confidence, peace. There's some people here the Lord wants to bring healing to. There's going to be people he brings healing. Physical healing. Emotional healing. Spiritual healing. And there's some people the Lord wants to take you on a little journey. He wants to teach you some things. So look, what's he going to teach me, Greg? I don't know, but I love those moments when he goes, come here, son, I've got some things to talk to you about. There's some things that are going to be unique to you that only you will get because he's going to use the furnishings of your mind and the history of your life and he's going to explain some part of who he is and only you will get that. And I love those moments because he's going to walk with you and teach you. I think there's some oil that he wants to pour into that. So for just the next two or three minutes, I'm going to invite you to just sit back and maybe like a sponge, just say, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm going to drink in. I'll take as much oil as you can pour. I want it to drip off me. I want it to splash on the people around me. I'll take as much as you can. And some of you are sitting there, well, I don't need any of that. This is not the time to use it. This is the time to buy it. It doesn't matter to me whether you feel like it. Store some oil up. So I'm going to invite you to just take two or three minutes. Just in your own heart, just draw near the Lord and say, Lord, fill me. I need your oil. Maybe it's in one of those five areas. You're going, Lord, that's me. I, I really just need more oil. I need you to fill my lamp. So let's just do that. And then I'm going to pray a prayer for all of us together.
Lord, we come to you like sponges, like empty buckets. Saying, Lord, pour your oil. Fresh this anointing, Lord. Fill us afresh, Lord, with your spirit. Lord, this, this need for us to be consecrated, set aside, Lord, dedicated to your service. Lord, I particularly want to pray for those people who felt like they've lost the call of God and that somehow you've walked away. That somehow, Lord, you've forgotten or backed down from your promise. And Lord, I, I release your oil. I, I release it, Lord, to them right now. That's beautiful, Lord. release a flow of your oil, Lord, and for the calling of God, for the sanctification of your people. Break, Lord, the lie. Break off condemnation. Fill their buckets with oil. Bright flame, Lord, that lasts until you come. For, Lord, people who need understanding, illumination of the temple, would you just pour oil, Lord? Some, some of us feel like, Lord, the, the last little flicker of the flame is going. Lord, fill the lamps with oil. Give understanding. Bring enlightenment. Open our eyes, Lord. Let us see. Pour, Lord, your spirit out. Fresh filling, Lord. Fresh understanding. Lord, there's some of us who need more power. We need to be filled and empowered again, Lord. I pray for power. I pray for a release of power. I pray for the dynamic energy of God internally in people. I pray, Lord, it would overflow, cause a flow of your energy, of your fire, of your power. Pour oil, Lord. Lord, right now, I just release your healing to everybody who needs it, Lord. Physical healings all over, Lord. Heal. Pour out the oil, Lord. We anoint your people with oil. We pray a prayer of faith, Lord. Release healing into bodies. Lord, for, for people who are emotionally needing healing, release healing, Lord, for their souls. Bring comfort, Lord, and peace. Pour oil, Lord. Fill the buckets. Those, Lord, who need to be spiritually healed. Comfort, comfort your people, Lord. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Tell her your sins have been forgiven. And Lord, I pray that for many, many people in this place, you would take us on a journey as you teach us. Because your word says, Lord, your anointing will teach us about all things. So we're asking, Lord, teach us. I pray for everybody, Lord, that you'd take them on a journey, pour enough oil into their life, Lord, for the length of the journey. We recognize, Lord, that now is the season. Now is the time to be gathering oil. And we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen.